Hi, welcome to Math 150, Section 2, Lecture 27. What I want to do today is talk about convergence of Taylor series and just trying to estimate how well do they do. And then given applications, we're going to apply this to the birthday problem. And anyway, we are reaching the end of the semester. I'm trying to find problems that will do a good job of reviewing what we have done throughout the semester. So not only will we hopefully be seeing something interesting, but we will be exploring and reviewing all the stuff we've been doing throughout the semester. When we did the lecture where we proved the fundamental theme of calculus, you know, I said if this was an episode of Friends, it would be titled The One With, what would it be the one with? The mean value theorem. And so again today, when we start looking at how well does the Taylor series do in approximating a function, it's going to be the one with the mean value theorem. We'll just keep hammering away with the mean value theorem. It is one of my favorite theorems in terms of how powerful it is and what you can do with it. I am not going to prove the best possible result for how well a Taylor series approximates the original function. With a little bit of additional work, you can prove a much better result with a factorial in the denominator, which would make the error much, much smaller. But I would rather not do the additional work. And we'll get a decent result. I think that's an excellent trade-off. Now, we have already seen that there are issues that you could have a Taylor series, uh, professor, is, but does not converge to the original function. And that should scare you a little bit. You know, you would hope that if it converges, it has to at least converge to the. Uh, professor. Yes. Yes. All right. So. Take two, it's hopefully recording. Uh, you hopefully are able to see this in Zoom land. I will try to have these adjusted so that you can see a good amount of All right, and so what we wanted to do, I think we're talking about Taylor series and just how good of an approximation they do. The main ingredient is going to be the mean value. So F is continuous differentiable on an interval A B. Then there exists a C in A B such that F times C is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So what that means is that we have a special point C where the instantaneous speed at C is equal to the average speed over the instant. And so if you just you know, draw a little bit, you know, here's A, here is B. The mean value theorem promises is at least one point where your instantaneous speed equals your average speed. It turns out in this, in this case that there are actually two such points. Now, one of the problems with the mean value theorem is it doesn't tell you where the point is. It's just an existence proof. If you're a political consultant and you tell the candidate, good news, there's a path to 270 electoral votes and you can win the presidency. And that's wonderful. And that path is, well, how it's an existence. No. It's nice to know that there is a path, but it's not as good as knowing what that path actually is and how you can actually win those votes. So here, it turns out in a lot of theoretical mathematics, just the existence of the point C is often enough. It would be better if we knew exactly where it was, if we had a constructive way to find it. But when we proved the fundamental theorem of calculus, we just needed to know that there was such a point. Now, there's many ways you can rewrite this. We could rewrite this as f of b is f of a plus f prime of c times b minus a. Or if we let x equal b and say a equals zero, we get f of x is f of zero plus f prime c sub x times f. And I'm putting a subscript x to remind myself that this point depends on x. And it's very easy to get confused as to where things depend. So there is some point that depends on x. Notice how close this is to the Taylor series. You know, the Taylor series would say f of x is approximately f of zero where you start, plus you instantaneous speed at time zero times the amount of time elapsed. That's approximately where you are. What we're getting instead is a perfect, a 
exact fit. The problem is we don't know where that point CX is. And so we can look at the Taylor series. So the end order Taylor series at the point X would be F of zero plus F prime of zero X plus F double prime of zero over two factorial X squared all the way up to an nth derivative at zero over n factorial x to the n. And so that will be the end order Taylor series. And it's set up so that things are going to match beautifully. The value at zero is equal to the function at zero. The first derivative at zero is the first derivative of the function at zero. And this goes all the way up to degree n. And so we will have a polynomial of degree n, and it's set up so that the first, the derivatives up to order n agree at zero. And we want to understand how good of a job does this do? What is the error? And so the error is f of x minus tn of x. And we want to understand how large can that error be? So let's call this function h of x. And we want to study how large h of x can be. I claim there's one point where it's very easy to understand the error. What is that one special value of x where we know what the error is? Let's one natural x to try. Zero. zero. If you plug in x equals zero, everything vanishes but f of zero. So we know that h of zero is zero. There's no error at zero. And we want to know as we start to move away from zero, what is the error? All right. Zoom land, this is visible? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if it's actually recording the video from my computer and just somehow it's not going on into. All right. Um, so let's look at the error. So we're going to review a lot of my favorite ideas in mathematics. Mathematicians are lazy. We do nothing. What are the two ways to do nothing algebraically? Add zero and multiply by one. Anybody have a good thought of what a nice way to add zero would be to h of x? h of x equals h of x. Or maybe subtract zero. What would be a good zero to subtract from h of x? Do we know anything involving h that is zero? So we want to use the mean value theorem. So we need to evaluate a function at two points. Do you know any point involving h? Well, we know the answer is going to be zero. h of zero. h of x is just h of x minus h of zero. And by the mean value theorem, <coughs> this is h prime at some point c of c1 times x minus zero. And we'll say, you know, c1 is in zero. I'll assume x is positive. So my integral is zero x. If it was negative, it would be x comma zero. So by the mean value theorem, the difference between h of x and h of zero, which is just h of x, which is just my error, is h prime of c1 times x minus zero. Okay. Let's look at what h prime of x is. It's going to be x prime of x minus, now let's take the derivative. The derivative of f of zero is just zero. f prime of zero times x, its derivative is just f prime of zero. The derivative of f double prime of zero over two factorial x squared, the two just comes down, and it's going to be plus two f double prime of zero over two factorial x, all the way up to n, n derivative of zero or n factorial x to the n minus one. What's a good value of x to plug in? 
There's one value of x where if you plug it in, we can evaluate this. It's Zero. And again, h prime of zero is f prime of zero minus f prime of zero times h. The onslaught of things that all of the initial zero. So what does h prime of zero equal? It's just zero. So h prime of c1 is just h prime of c1 minus h prime of zero. Right? So my error, h of x, is going to be h prime of c1 minus h prime of 0 times x. So I'm just going through what's in the notes. How can we study h prime of c1 minus h prime of 0? What could we use to study that? Mu mm -hmm. value theorem, right? This is very similar to the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. You keep hammering away with the mean value theorem. This is going to be by the mean value theorem h double prime of c2 c1 times x. It's technically if you want c1 minus 0 times x, but I might as well just write c1. And we can just continue. So if you read the instructions of shampoo, how should you use it? What are the directions on shampoo? <laughs> no, okay, well, three words, lather, rinse, repeat. rinse, repeat. <laughs> you just keep doing it. This is the shampoo method of mathematics. Lather and repeat, lather and repeat, lather and repeat. We keep doing this. So we first got the R H of X, then it was H prime of C1 times X, then H double prime of C2 times C1 X. And we keep doing this. How many times do we do this? Well, if I take N derivatives, X to the N is going to go all the way down to one. If I take N plus one derivatives, there's nothing left over, it's all gone. So it's going to be, I do N plus one derivatives, at some point, Cn plus 1, and I'll have Cn, Cn minus 1, C1 times x. So I just keep going on and on and on. And so I get that the error is equal to the absolute value of h of x. And this is going to be less equal to the maximum over Cn plus 1, less equal to x. The n plus first derivative at cn plus one times x to the n plus one. And the reason is if I take n plus one derivatives, the polynomial is all gone. Tn of f n plus one derivatives kills it. So n plus one derivatives of h is just n plus one derivatives of f. And I'm just saying, let's look at the largest this can be. The largest that can be is going to be a good bound for my error. Worst case scenario, we're doing worst case scenario. We are assuming that anything that can go wrong goes wrong all in the same time. What's the worst case for the product of the C? The worst case is if C1 is almost X, just a little bit less than that. And C2 is almost C1, which is almost X. And C3 is, and so on and so on and so on. So how large could this product be? The largest it could be is if they're all equal to x. So this is an upper bound. And so this would be Taylor's theorem with remainder. This is not the best remainder, but it is a good enough remainder for many applications. If I give you uh, sine or cosine as your original function, what can you tell me about the derivatives of sine and cosine? How large can they be? One. So as long as I'm close, you know, if x is you know even one half, I start getting one half to a huge power, and I'm going to get good convergence. This is not the best result. If you do a little bit more work, you can have I think an n plus one factorial down below. Okay. 
the factorial function grows so rapidly, I would like the n plus one factorial of the denominator. If I'm doing applications, sure. But I like this that I can do it essentially on two blackboards. And it just shows you repeating the mean value theorem. It shows you subtracting zero. And again, it all comes down to clever ways to rewrite things. That we want to use the mean value theorem. When you look at the function h of x, it's not immediately clear that this is a mean value theorem. But if I write it as h of x minus h of zero, ah, now I can use the mean value theorem. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so now we turn to the application today, to the birthday problem. So the birthday problem, how many people do you need in a room before you have at least a 50% chance that two people share a birthday. Now, you've got to be extremely careful when you do a problem that you know what your assumptions are. <clears throat> what are we assuming? What do you think we might assume in doing a birthday problem? How many days are in the year? Okay, so what is how many days are in the year? And how many days are there in the year? Depends if, it's a leap year. Depends if it's a leap year. And so I actually have a deal with admissions that no one is allowed to attend Williams College and take my math classes if they were born on February 29th because it screws up this lecture. Right, because of the society we're in, this is of course a joke. If you were born on February 29th, you are welcome to attend this lecture. But you know, February 29th only comes up once every four years. True or false? Once a yeah, there's, there's all these strange rules, except once every century, every 200 years, and then it, this it's really complicated as to what happens. So we will ignore the February 29th controversy. What else are we going to assume about birthdays for the birthday problem? It's evenly distributed. It's evenly distributed. Do you think birthdays are evenly distributed across the year? I'm sorry? So, <laughs> you know, again, this is a very delicate topic. Um, there is the Super Bowl boost in birthdays, and I believe this has been documented, uh, that there are certain events. But let's take athletes, for example. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers has a brilliant passage where he replaces the names of the players with their birthday in the like, Canadian Junior Hockey Championship game from some year. And it's essentially January, February, and March passing the puck to each other and then shooting against a goal defended by January, February, and March with a scattering of maybe a few Aprils and Mays. Why do you think birthdays of athletes might not be uniformly distributed? Because like the cutoff days or Friday, or like joints are in these. Yes, so the cutoff, you know, this cutoffs for when you can join certain leagues. Do you want to just make the cutoff or do you want to just miss? You want to just miss because when you are very young, you know, six months to a year is huge developmental. At this point, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. But when you're young, it makes a huge difference. And you want to be basically one of the biggest kids that just misses out because if you're much bigger than a lot of the other players, you'll look like you're one of the better players. And again, it's not a guarantee, but there's a good chance that you'll be one of the better players. So you get more playing time. So the coaches like you. So you get recommended for special leagues and opportunities. And that small little asymmetry propagates. So there are a lot of conversations on campus about you know, different equity issues. This is a wonderful example of how through a small little accident, you may be missing out on a tremendous amount of hockey talent. Now, some of us might actually care about other sports than hockey, so we may not be so concerned about missing out on hockey talent, but you can apply this to other things. I'm curious, what is the distribution of birthdays of Williams students? A lot of school districts have you know, a cutoff of you must be born by such and such a date if you want to make it or you miss and you have to go to the next year. Is it better to just make or just miss? 
For a lot of things, it might be better to just miss. You might be a little bit more mature, a little bit better able to follow directions. Your coloring might be a little. Bit. But it would be interesting as to does that little bit make a difference and does it propagate? Is there a little bit of a bias in the birthdays of William students? And if anybody is interested, let me know and I can see if we can gather that data in the college. And you know, again, it's are we doing things that are going to prevent us from you know recognizing all talent equal? And does it make a difference? There are parents who deliberately uh, do not have their kids go into the grade that they could, but they hold them back a year because they want them to be a little bit more developmentally mature, or they want them to be a little bit larger so that when they're playing athletics, they're not going to be one of the weaker kids, they'll be one of the stronger kids. So a lot of interesting things to think about. So we will assume that all birthdays are equally likely. We will assume that there are no November, no February 29th, and we will assume that the birthdays are independent. You know, when I taught this class last year, I had identical twins in the first row. And so, is it possible for identical twins not to have the same birthday? Yes. Uh, one of my, it's, it's possible, it's unlikely. The largest gap I know from you know, people I know is six hours between the birth of one twin and the other. But if you see identical twins, almost surely same birth. So we will assume that we don't have any situations like that. And we want to calculate how many people do we need in the room before we have at least a 50% chance that at least two people share a birthday. In probability, math 341, sat 341, it's often easy not to calculate the probability that something happens, but instead of calculate what? It that it doesn't happen. And it turns out there is a huge, huge, huge difference. And the reason is if I look at n people, how many ways are there to have at least two people share a birthday? I could have three people share a birthday or four people share a birthday. I could have two sets of twos. I could have a two and a five. There's so many ways to have things matching. It's much easier to say, what's the number of ways, what's the probability that nobody shares a birthday with anybody else? Okay, so we will let Pn is the probability n people do not share a birthday with d days in a year. So we'll do the more general case. In your mind, when you see d days in a year, what are you thinking? 365. If you happen to go to Pluto, it would be, I think, on the order of 90,000 days. Can anybody give me an N where you are guaranteed that at least two people share birthday? 366 D plus one. Now, if I have a little bit fewer than D over two birth, your people in the room, each person comes in, you know, if nobody shares a birthday, has roughly a 50-50 chance of sharing a birthday with somebody in the room. So if you're a little bit less than D over two, as a couple of people walk in, for all of them to have new birthdays becomes very hard. Each one of them is a one half times one half times one half times one half. So I expect that by the time I get to D over two, I'm almost surely going to have at least two people sharing a birthday. We want to try to understand how the answer depends on D. As I increase D, how many people do I need? So let's try to calculate P. So when the first person walks into the room, what is the probability that the first person shares a birthday with, it, with someone else? Zero. So the probability that they do not share a birthday with anybody else is one. I'm gonna write one as one minus zero over D. Now the next person walks in. What's the probability that the next person does not share a birthday with the first person? One. I'm sorry? Or one of the that they do. So right. So it's one minus. And when the next person walks in, what's the probability that they don't share birthday with either the first two? One minus two. One minus two over D. And we keep doing this until we get to one. We have N people coming in. So think carefully. N minus one. 
Because when the nth person walks in, there's n minus one people already there. And we want this to be about it. Now, if you try to calculate this on your, on your calculator, it's going to get really bad. If I take V equals 365, it's 365 over 365 times 364 over 365 times 363 over 365. And so it would be roughly 365 minus n minus 1. Over 365 minus n factorial 365 to the n. I have 365 to the n from all the denominators. This gives me 365, 364, 363, all the way down to 365 minus quantity n minus 1, and then this cancels everything from that point on. If you try to just evaluate 365 factorial, if you have a calculator right now, if you plug that in, I think that should overload your calculator. Mathematica is able to handle large things like that. I think it was a little bit less than 10 to the 800. Yeah. It's a large number. When you want to calculate something like this, it's much easier to do it you know, term by term by term rather than doing all the numerators and all the denominators. So it's a real challenge to evaluate something like this. And we would want to keep multiplying until we get to about one half. Right. Any thoughts about how we might try to understand this product? Taylor series? No. We will eventually use Taylor series, but before we use Taylor series, we will use yeah. why? Okay. It's a product, right? Whenever you see a product, your first thought should be logarithms. If you then look up and you see that you're in a second grade math class as a helper, you then resist the temptation to use logarithms. But you know, when you're in a college setting, you should think, hey, let me try a logarithm. So we've got the log of Pn is equal to the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of the log of 1 minus k over d. And we're using the log of a product as the sum of the log. Now we use the Taylor series. So the log of 1 minus x is negative x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3. This was the only Taylor series where I actually calculated all the derivatives and pieced it together. This was not an accident. When we did that, I deliberately did the log of 1 minus x and not the log of 1 plus x because I knew we were going to use the log of 1 minus x later. <laughs> and so now it's set up. So if x is small, what is the log of 1 minus x approximately? The log of 1 minus x is approximately minus, minus x. Okay, if, x is small. if x is small, the log of 1 minus x is about negative x. I'm doing the first order Taylor series. Oh, I was thinking like x would be small, so it would be like log of 1. So that's easy. Well, and, and so if x is small, this should be very close to 0. And if x is small, this is close to 0. If you wanted a better job, you would do negative x minus x squared over 2. So as a nice exercise, you could actually do a little bit better job than we're going to do today and keep the second order. I'm going to do so many approximations today. You know, I'm going to just play a little fast. And, move. and you will see at the end of the day, it makes almost no difference how much I approximate by. So this then becomes approximately the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of now we just have so it'll be negative k over d. So it's negative 1 over d, the sum k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of k. Alright, so we need to figure out what is that sum. We've seen a sum like this before. When we were trying to show is the fundamental theorem of calculus true? Well, what, what, what functions can we integrate? We could integrate you know, a straight line. We could integrate, and that gave us a rectangle. We could integrate a line at an angle, and that gave us a triangle. And then we went up to parabolas and cubics, and those are real tests of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Rectangles and triangles, it's not that exciting. 
parabolas and cubics, you know, we hadn't seen fullness for those. For the quadratic, we would need to know what the sum of k squared was. And there's ways to prove that, and you would need to use that if we kept the next term. There is a simple way to prove the sum of k. And this goes all the way back to Gauss. So if I look at 0 plus 1 all the way up to plus m, so instead of summing up to m minus 1, which is the general term summing up to m, I could write the numbers backwards as m plus m minus 1 plus 0. 0 plus m is 1 plus m minus 1. And so all of these are m. And how many times do we have it? I'm sorry? M Not m times, almost. M plus one, m plus one times, because we start with zero. So what this tells us is one plus two, or actually zero, plus m is equal to m, m plus one divided by two. And I have to divide by two because I'm double counting terms. I'm writing them backwards. So in general, you would use proofs by induction to handle the sum, but this nice trick of writing things backwards. The story is that allegedly Gauss was in a class and the teacher wanted some quiet time so to get the little brass to shut up. The teacher had them add the numbers from one to 100 and thinking that this would occupy them for a while. And Gauss goes, you know, 5,050 almost immediately. So, we now use this formula, we take m equals n minus 1, and we get the log of 1 half, which is negative log 2, and using our power rule for logs, is approximately negative 1 over d, and then I'm going to have n minus 1 times n over 2. Okay, so we would get the negatives cancel, so we get n minus 1 times n is about 2d log 2, or n, n minus 1 is about d log 4. How would you solve this equation? n times n minus 1 is about d log 4. Any thoughts as to how we would solve this? What are we trying to solve for? Mm -hmm. N. So find N such that N minus 1 times N is equal to D log 4. Any thoughts as to how we would solve this equation? Quadratic, quadratic formula. Right? Eh, I don't really want to do the quadratic formula. I'm going to say instead, because this is approximately, eh, call it n minus a half squared is about d log 4. And if you expand this out, this is n squared minus n. If you expand this out, it's n squared minus n plus 1 quarter. So n minus 1 and n, you know, their product is extremely close to n minus a half squared. Yes? Where is the 1 half? Uh, because when I have my sum, oh, I'm replacing n minus 1 times n with n minus a half squared. This number is halfway between n minus 1 and n. Oh, I meant like when we had the log of 1 half. Oh, because I want the probability to be 50%. Oh, okay. Right, I'm trying to find what n gives me a probability of 50%. Okay. And then the 1 half here is that this product is essentially the same as that product. But now I don't need to use the quadratic formula. You know, if n minus a half squared equals d log 4, then n minus a half is the square root of d log 4, and so you get n is approximately 1 half plus the square root of d log 4. And so we've been able to do all of this on just one blackboard. This is the power of Taylor series. Now, you can actually do the calculation and see what is the answer, because we have made some approximations. You could see how much would you gain if you kept the next term. So 
I will try to do this without destroying the video over here. Um, So if you take um, if you take e equals three sixty five, what we get is twenty two point nine nine four four. If we use this approximation, if we solve the quadratic using this, we get twenty two point nine 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 nine. Right, so we're different by about point zero zero six days. Given that we're trying to find a value of n that's an integer, I'm not really too concerned about errors that are by you know, six thousandths, very small. And it made the math a lot easier. You can then go through and figure out what would happen if you did higher. So if we did zero squared plus one squared plus m squared, that's m m plus one, two m plus one divided by six. So if you wanted to try to include the next term, you would have to have n equals n minus one. So you get n minus one times n times two m minus one over six. And you would now have a cubic. And you'd have to try to figure out, well, what's the root of the cubic? There's ways to do that. We could use Newton's method to approximate it. There's you know, things you can do. And you can see how much of a difference does it make? Very, very little. So a lot of really good stuff here. We see that the special day is growing like the square root of D. So on Pluto, there's 90,000 days roughly on Pluto. 90,000 is nine times 10,000. Square root of nine is three, square root of 10,000 is 100. So the square root of D would be about 300. What's the log of four? Well, the log of E is one, the log of E squared is two. This is somewhere between one and two. So it's somewhere between you know, 300 and 600 you know, for how many people you need on Pluto. So it's nice to be able to you know, really quick estimates like that. It's growing like square root of D. You can also go back now and check and see, well, how bad is our error? If we're only going up to about square root of D, the largest term is basically square root of D over D. That's one over square root of D. So if I stop over here, the next term is going to be of size square root of d over d squared. That's 1 over d. So that would be about 1 over 365. Oh, okay, 1 over 365. That's pretty small. And if I'm on Pluto, that's even better. It's 1 over 90,000. So the approximation, the log of 1 minus x is minus x. It's actually a pretty good approximation if we are looking on Earth an even better one if we're looking into it. So again, lots of great stuff on this. The probability of an event, it's often easy to find the probability that the event doesn't happen. And if you're looking for math classes to take, I am teaching probability next year. Linear algebra is normally a prereq, but if it's something that you're interested in, we can talk. When you have a product, take logarithms, use the log rules, now, another way we could attack this problem is if you look at like the log of 1 minus k over d, as k gets larger and larger and larger, what happens to 1 minus kd? So as k gets larger, what happens to 1 minus kd? It gets closer to 2. It gets closer to 2. Is it, go, is it going down strictly or is it fluctuating up and down? Down it's going down strictly. I have a sequence of terms. I'm taking the logarithm. All of these terms are moving in the same direction. What can I use to try to approximate that sum? So, do we have any tests from sequences in series? Yeah, you could use the integral test. So, try to approximate that sum by converting that sum to an integral and see can you evaluate that? So for extra credit, if you want, try to evaluate this using the integral test. Or for extra credit, you know, try to keep the next term and see how much of a change does that make. And you'll see that it makes very little 
difference, you know, keeping that next term. And again, we're lucky, we're trying to figure out how many people. Are you allowed to have three quarters of a person enter a party? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, has anybody seen The Last Dragon movie? I watched that with my with one of my nieces and my daughter. And at one point, you know, the dragon you know, has a beautiful line. You know, if I told you I found three quarters of your dog, would you be happy? No. And so you're not going to let three fourths of a person, you're either in the party or you're not. And so for a lot of problems, it's really nice that we only have to find things to within an integer. And so small little fluctuations like this, it's around 23 people. All right, so this is a good place to stop. I'm very curious as to uh, why it was working the way it was, but all right.